This terrible incident occurred in 1995 during a high-profile trial that received national notice. It was uh, a gigantic shock. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we certainly had no inkling that this was going to happen. I, I'm not aware that anybody did. After being found guilty of arson and now facing up to 21 years in prison, Marin covers his face and appears to swallow something. In some shocking cases, convicts who were being tried for murder ended up losing their lives while on trial. Let's explore some of the most surprising cases of convicts who were unalived in court and the full stories behind them. On March 4, 2009, David Paradiso was standing trial at the Stockton Courthouse in California. David Paradiso's unfortunate path was even worse when he became involved in a judicial saga. Aged 26 back in 2006, Paradiso had been arrested and charged with homicide. According to the overwhelming evidence, Paradiso had taken the life of his girlfriend, Elaine Pelt. In fact, it's unknown if they considered themselves a couple yet, they'd only been dating for a few weeks. Elaine was in the back seat of David's mom, Deborah, with David in the back. All was well as far as Deborah could tell, an argument ensued. Within seconds, Paradiso pulled out a knife and unalived Eileen right there, in the back seat of his mother's car. According to Deborah, her son shouted that he needed to do this, otherwise Eileen would have done it first. Here's where it gets even more outrageous. Instead of stopping the car or rushing Eileen to a hospital, David convinced his mom to drive from Loy, California to a remote road in rural Amador County. There, he took Eileen out and disposed of her alongside a dirt road, like she was garbage. Honestly, how do you talk yourself out of this? And why on earth did his mother comply with the plan? Reportedly, she was afraid of her son in that rabid state he was in that day. According to Deborah, David had consumed crystal that day. He was soon arrested and charged. His trial began three years later in 2009. On March 4th, David Perdisso took the stand and reconfirmed what he had told law enforcement three years before. He had taken his girlfriend's life. Except this time, his motive changed. He no longer said that he was trying to protect his life. This time, Paradiso said he unalived her because he thought she did not deserve to live. Yeesh. His statement was so shocking that a pause was ordered by Judge Cinda Fox during the trial. Deborah left the courtroom in tears. But this was by far the most shocking moment of the day. For David, this break was the perfect opportunity to pull out a makeshift knife and attempt to unalive the judge. <laughs> It's a stunning video. Indeed, David ran up to Cinda Fox as she was leaving her chair and jagged her several times. Then he lifted her up and put her down and continued to throw punches. Paradiso's attorney, Chuck Pacheo, describes the horrific moment. Once the um, Paradiso jumped on the judge and um, began to stab her in the neck, I moved uh, from the council table up to the judge's uh, uh, table and she was laying on her back, looking up towards the ceiling, and Paradiso was working on her. Bailiffs ran to her aid, but Detective Eric Bradley, who was in the courtroom that day, thought this wasn't enough, so he fired a few times at David Paradiso. Paradiso lost his life almost immediately in that courtroom. Detective Bradley was put on temporary leave while his actions were investigated. A day later, NBC published an article after speaking to Deborah. According to her, she'd been seriously concerned about David's mental health in the weeks prior to the court hearing. He had become increasingly aggressive, jumping at authorities over nothing, and putting everyone, including himself, in harm's way. Deborah said, I think he was having a breakdown. She said that she saw a sort of sorrow in her son's eyes that wasn't there before. Deborah had even called the sheriff's department two weeks before to warn them that David had a weapon. His cell was searched and nothing was found, so the department dismissed Deborah's call and general concerns about her son's behavior. Paradiso's attorney also said that he thought that the incident was likely given his client's mental state, especially prior to the hearing. He could have. I was always guarded with him, um, um, and I always watched him. Yeah, he was capable of doing something like that. Judge Cinda Fox retired on grounds of disability following the incident. 
It's unclear how Paradiso's actions affect her physically today, but it's safe to say it was a deeply traumatic event. A year later, Judge Fox sued the county sheriff's office and various others. In the lawsuit, she explained that deputies had prior knowledge that Paradiso was planning to harm someone and they had information that had manufactured a deadly weapon. The lawsuit was dismissed and Detective Eric Bradley was reinstated into law enforcement. However, David's grieving family remain heartbroken. Deborah and her surviving son, Aaron, stated that this tragedy could have been avoided if any authority had addressed her concerns about David's declining mental health. He had schizophrenia, and that's what the whole thing was supposed to be about. Indeed, David's mental health issues had deeper roots, which may even explain his terrible crime in 2006. While he had to be punished for it, authorities could have done a better job of offering him treatment and rehabilitation, and of course, keeping him alive. This terrifying story begins with a little girl called Anna Backmeyer. Anna Backmeyer was born in Lübeck, Germany on November 14, 1972, to Marianne Backmeyer, who was 23 at the time. Anna's father chose not to be involved in the pregnancy or Anna's upbringing, so Marianne was raising Anna as a single parent. Marianne worked as a waitress at a local bar while Anna attended elementary school. Marianne would often work late hours and close the bar, so Anna would walk from school to her mother's bar and hang out there until Marianne was done. And some mornings, Marianne would be too tired to walk Anna to school. Some people in the community didn't agree with this, but what was a single mother to do? On the morning of May 5th, 1980, Anna had an argument with her mother. She left home upset and decided she would walk over to a friend's house instead of going to school that day. But her friend wasn't home. It's likely she'd gone to school, so Anna decided to walk to school as well, but she never made it to the school gates. Just a few houses away from her own home, she was stopped by a 35-year-old man called Klaus Grabowski. He was the local butcher and a familiar face. When he saw Anna, he asked her if she wanted to come in and play with his cats. Poor Anna thought nothing of it. Grabowski essayed Anna for several hours before unaliving her with a pair of his fiance's tights. Imagine learning who you've just got engaged to this way. Grabowski then placed Anna's body in a box and buried her on the banks in the local canal in a shallow grave. When his fiance returned home from work later that afternoon and learned what he'd done, she immediately contacted authorities. Investigators discovered Anna's remains and arrested Grabowski that day. That same day, detectives also found out that Grabowski had received a probation sentence in 1973, and in 1975, he essayed two nine-year-olds. Wait, how was he not punished for this? Reportedly, he was. Grabowski accepted the option of chemical castration instead of a prison sentence in 1976. It's shocking that it was an option in the first place. And then there was another shocking layer to the story. It turns out, Grabowski Grabowski lied to a doctor and obtained hormone therapy to reverse the effects of his punishments. On March 3, 1981, his trial for taking Anna Backmeyer's life began. Grabowski's testimony was sickening. He said that seven-year-old Anna had attempted to seduce him and that he had unalived her because she had threatened to tell her mother of the attack unless he gave her money. Marianne sat in the courtroom fuming. How could he say these things about her daughter? How could he not show one ounce of remorse? or at least reason, he saw himself as a victim in this stomach-turning story. With a violent father and a mother who abandoned her when she was a teenager. On March 6, three days into the trial, Marianne arrived early, as always, sporting her elegant trench coat. She made the decision to take affairs into her own hands. Except this time she carried a .22 caliber Beretta in her pocket. She waited for Grabowski to enter the courtroom and sit down before the room was filled with people. As soon as he sat, she fired seven rounds at him. Grabowski's lifeless body was carried out of the room that day, to no one's regret. In Marianne's eyes, that was the only possible justice for him. His lack of remorse and attempt to shift the blame onto Anna meant that he would never really sit and think about what he'd done, no matter the amount of years behind bars he would get. But of course, Marianne knew that she would be arrested for this. After all, she'd done it in front of several officers and bailiffs. She exhibited no regret. She was sentenced to six years for manslaughter, but she served only three. When she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, Marianne contacted a television network to make a documentary about her life and Anna's story. She died in 1996, and she was buried next to Anna. Here is 
another disgusting man you might not have heard of. Slobodan Parjak was a Bosnian Croy war criminal. Let's look at how Praljak ended up on trial and what motivated him to take such dramatic measures. Parjak was born in Yugoslavia in 1945. He became a professor and ran an electronics business. It all seemed fine and dandy until the 1991 Croatian War of Independence. The Croats fought the Serb-controlled Yugoslavia to break free from it. And for those of you who don't know, it was one of the worst massacres in European history. Over 40,000 people lost their lives and countless others were displaced. To this day, conflicts continue in the region because of past allegiances and different cultures and religions, and many army generals during the war committed genocide. Enter Slobodan Parjak. Indeed, this man, who was once a professor, joined the war and quickly rose to general position. It's unclear what motivated him to be so vicious, but he did a long series of unspeakable things during the war, including setting the notorious Dreel camp. Here, Croats would take imprisoned Bosnian men and subject them to things we can't even begin to describe here. Bosniak men faced brutality and mistreatment. After the war ended in 1995, Praljak returned to his regular life as if nothing happened. In fact, he even started a successful tobacco company and wrote 25 books as if he was some kind of hero, a nationalist hero some looked up to. However, his actions caught up to him by the early 2000s when he and five others were charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity. His only defense was that these crimes were done by his men, but not under his orders. He painted himself as someone who, at worst, did not intervene, but never ordered these things. His trial began in April 2006, and it lasted a staggering seven years. In 2013, he was sentenced to 20 years behind bars. At his sentencing, Slobodin would not hear any of it. He said the ruling was outrageous and that he was, of course, innocent. He contested the ruling, claiming innocence. He subjected thousands of people to things worse than death, and yet he was unwilling to do seven years in prison. In November 2017, in the Hagi, Netherlands, another court went over his charges, maintaining some and dismissing others. However, the conclusion was the same, 20 years behind bars. His 20-year prison sentence, however, remained unaffected. With 13 years spent in jail or prison already, Praljak had only about seven years left to serve. And yet, he was just as outraged and unwilling to accept the verdict. When the judge maintained the sentence, he spoke up. Following the pronouncement by the judge, he made a stunning remark in the courtroom. He pulled out a tiny brown container from his suit and drank whatever was in it. Then, he proudly told the court, I just drank poison. Praljak was rushed to a hospital but died on the way. In one last dramatic gesture, he took control of his life and denied responsibility for his despicable war crimes. It remains unclear to this day how he got his hands on the toxin in a hoggy courthouse or in jail. Jonathan Schlitz unalived Scott Amadur in cold blood in March 1995 after the latter confessed that he had a crush on Schmitz on a daytime talk show. Few courtroom cases have been as frightening and emotionally fraught as Jonathan Schmitz's attempt to take his own life. Jonathan Schmitz was 24 years old when he was invited on the Jenny Jones talk show, a popular talk show in 1995. During the episode, Jonathan was told that a person who had a secret crush on him would be revealed. Schmitz was excited to participate. He thought he would end up dating a gorgeous woman. When he arrived at the studio, he saw a woman he recognized in the audience and thought, she must be the admirer. Lieutenant Bruce Naley said he figured she was his secret admirer and walked up and kissed her. But then they told him, oh no, she's not your secret admirer. This is. The host pointed to him, 32-year-old Scott Amadur. Schmitz, a calm and humble man, was asked to the program by a producer who explained that a hidden admirer wished to expose their name. Schmitz had no idea that the admirer would turn out to be Scott Amadur, another guest on the show. Scott was an acquaintance of Jonathan's. They had been introduced to each other by a mutual friend called Donna Riley. But Jonathan could not believe what was happening. Not once in his mind was there a possibility of gay admirers. He had agreed to do the show, so he didn't know what to do or what his rights were, so he sat there and went along with it. Schmitz told Scott that he was definitely heterosexual. The audience had a laugh and brushed it off as an unfortunate mishap. 
The two even hugged it off on screen. The piece was broadcast on national television, exposing Schmitz to mockery and disgrace. But three days after the show, Jonathan Schmitz returned home from a night out and found an anonymous note on his door. Its contents were never revealed, but reportedly it was the last drop for an already fuming Schmitz. He grabbed his weapon and knocked on Scott's door. When he opened, he aimed and fired twice. Right after, Schmitz called law enforcement and confessed. His trial was a media circus. This terrible incident occurred in 1995, during a high-profile trial that received national notice. His defense attorney claimed that Schmitz felt publicly humiliated on The Jenny Jones Show, and that pushed him over the edge. He said he suffered from melancholy and hopelessness. These are absolute psychiatric terms for depression. But the bottom line was, according to his defense, Schmitz was not in his right mind when he committed the crime, and he should not face a life sentence or be charged with first-degree murder. Prosecutors then made a claim that pushed the trial to even more headlines. They claimed that Schmitz killed Amateur in cold blood in an attempt to hide the fact that the pair were in fact having an affair. Scott Amadur's friend even testified to this affair on the stand. It was becoming a soap opera. Prosecutor Richard Thompson said, what what you are seeing on the tape is a 24-year-old man facing the studio audience and the camera with what I consider to be an ambush. He is visibly upset. People are laughing. It's like a Roman circus where the audience gives a thumbs up or a thumbs down to everything that is going on. Schmitz's attorney revealed that his father often made hateful comments at home and Schmitz committed his crime out of a gay panic that followed. In 1996, Schmitz was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison. While everyone was getting ready to close the files and exit the courtroom, Schmitz pulled out a revolver and tried to take his own life. Spectators, attorneys, and court officials were all stunned as Schmitz pointed the revolver at his own head and fired. If everything beforehand made waves, imagine what this moment did. People were watching in disbelief. Others were crying, while others rushed to stop Schmitz before it was too late. No one was quick enough to retrieve the gun from Schmitz, but miraculously, the round he fired was not lethal. He was rushed to the hospital and underwent surgery. The shocking event prompted two discussions. One, courtroom security should be improved. No defendant should have a weapon on them. Two, there should be more thorough mental health evaluations for all defendants. In Jonathan Schmitz's case, this incident painted a picture more favorable for the defense. Eventually, they said Schmitz suffered from a thyroid disorder and manic depression. After court-ordered psychiatrists evaluated him, they also concluded that he had a personality disorder. In 1999, he had a retrial, but was given the same sentence. In 2017, Schmitz was released on parole and has been leading a very low-key life. Scott Amadura's family sued the Jenny Jones show for Scott's wrongful death. They claimed that the show never did a background check on Schmitz, and if they did, they would have found addiction and mental health issues that would have been a big enough red flag to abort the plan. The family was awarded $30 million in a settlement. In March 2005, the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia was subjected to a shocking incident and Brian Nichols was at the center of it. Brian Nichols was at the core of this terrible episode. Brian Nichols was born in December 1971 and grew up in a middle-class household in Baltimore, Maryland. As a kid, adults around him would say he had a knack for trouble. When he was a teenager, he seemed to be a promising football player. However, in 1995, he dropped out of college and moved to Georgia, where he got a job at UPS. Then it was all downhill. Nichols became involved with trafficking. Then when he found out his girlfriend was dating a minister from the church they both attended, he decided to punish her in indescribable ways. In the early 2000s, he was arrested on SA and kidnapping charges. As soon as he was in jail awaiting trial, Nichols' friends and family expressed concern that he wanted to escape. In March 2005, his trial began. Nichols was being led to the Fulton County Courthouse for his trial in March 2005. Nobody expected this normal excursion to set off a terrible chain of events. Before even entering the courtroom, Brian Nichols overpowered a deputy sheriff, grabbed her weapon, and unalived her. Then he entered the courtroom and fired at the presiding judge, Roland Barnes, and a court reporter, Julianne Brandau. Both of them lost their lives. 
Nichols then escaped the courtroom and generated a huge manhunt in Atlanta. For 26 hours, Nichols was on the run, carjacking, firing at random people, and robbing stores. At around 10 p.m., he attempted to rob a couple at an apartment on Lenox Road. Five minutes later, Nichols encountered U.S. ICE agent David Willem and unalived him before stealing his weapon, badge, and Chevrolet pickup. On March 12th, at around 2.30 a.m., Nichols took a prisoner in her own apartment. Ashley Smith was returning from an errand to her apartment when Nichols surprised her, binding her hands and feet in her living room. They sat there talking about religion and family for hours until Nichols relaxed and untied Ashley. It was at this apartment that law enforcement finally caught up to him. When Ashley's boyfriend came to her aid, she was quick enough to dial 911, and Nichols realized it was too late to do anything about it. When the officers arrived, he let the woman go and surrendered. He let his prisoner go unhurt and turned himself into authority. Now, his list of charges was 10 times longer than before. He received repeated life sentences without the possibility of parole. A Fulton County grand jury indicts Nichols on 24 counts, including four counts of felony murder. District Attorney Paul Howard says the state will seek the death penalty. In addition, Nichols is indicted on three counts of aggravated assault on a police officer, 18 counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, two counts of aggravated battery, seven counts of kidnapping and kidnapping with bodily injury, seven counts of armed robbery, and five counts of robbery by force, theft by taking, escape, and hijacking a motor vehicle. To the surprise of no one, Nichols pled not guilty. He was just as defensive and unwilling to take responsibility for his actions as he was when he came up with that evil plan a few days before. But on November 7, 2008, Brian Nichols was found guilty on all 54 counts and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He very nearly escaped the ultimate sentence. Once again, this case was a case that sparked heated conversations about courtroom security. It seemed a bit too easy for Nichols to overpower an officer and begin a tragic rampage. It's quite sad how it takes a devastating incident like this for changes to be brought to the legal system. But this is how it seems to be. After Nichols' case, numerous courthouses around the United States increased security and devised new strategies to prevent violent convicts like him from carrying out such actions. The case also brought to light concerns with mental health and criminal justice system. Nichols' defense team claimed that he wasn't in his right mind when he committed the atrocities. However, Nichols was never properly evaluated evaluated or treated for the said mental health issues. This thankfully has improved over the last two decades. We end today's list with an odd tale. The tale of Michael Marin is a remarkable and bewildering one. Michael Marin was born on December 2, 1958 in Salisbury, Rhodesia, and went on to have a very bright life, at least in the beginning. He attended Brigham Young University, after which he enrolled at Yale Law. Soon after, he began working on Wall Street, advising on complex investments throughout the 1980s and 90s. Simply put, these were the times when crafty Wall Streeters were making millions. And Michael did. He owned a multi-million dollar mansion in Arizona, collected art by a Pablo Picasso and traveled to exotic destinations on all continents several times a year. He had many luxurious properties, as well as an art collection that included works by luminaries such as Picasso. In 2001, he climbed Mount Everest and appeared on TV afterwards to celebrate the rare accomplishment. He appeared to be living the ideal American dream, although an extravagantly wealthy one. He was also married with four children. From afar, he seemed as happy as one could be. But you know how sometimes the richer you get, the more you spend? As it turns out, Michael had a huge mortgage on his Arizona house and he was behind on payment. He became even more desperate, cutting corners and attempting sketchy schemes. He even tried to raffle it off at a charity benefit. Then he set his house on fire. Marin came from the heart of this raging flame, a very perplexing sight. Yep, you heard right. His whole house was reduced to ashes in an attempt to get the insurance money. Law enforcement soon caught up to Marin and arrested him, charging him with arson and insurance fraud. In May 2012, his court hearings began. He was facing anywhere from 7 to 21 years if convicted. When police got to the scene, they discovered the former Wall Street broker dressed not to escape a blazing skyscraper, but for a day at sea. 
Marin was pretty easy to convict. When officers caught up to him that day, his house was still in flames, and he was wearing scuba diving gear. He couldn't deny the arson had been planned. His ridiculous costume was his plan to escape the fire with enough oxygen. Also, who has complete diving suits in their bedroom, ready to use in case of fire? Then, the fire investigation revealed that the fire was intentionally set in four separate areas. Two and two were put together, and Michael Marin's well-known financial problems completed the picture. In June 2012, he was found guilty. You find the defendant, Michael James Marin, guilty of arson of an occupied structure. Then, look what happened. After being found guilty of arson and now facing up to 21 years in prison, Marin covers his face and appears to swallow something. We'll come back to this scene. Marin seems to bury his face in his hands and yawn. But no, he swallowed something. Eight minutes later, Marin starts convulsing and collapses. Marin poisoned himself, leaving behind a wife and four kids in utter shock. In fact, no one around him was expecting him to even have this plan. He appeared calm throughout his arrest and trial. It was uh, a gigantic shock. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we certainly had no inkling that this was going to happen. I, I'm not aware that anybody did. Just like escaping his burning house in scuba gear, he escaped conviction in the most horrible way. Hey, thanks for watching. Do you know of other similar stories? Let me know in a comment, and before you go, make sure you like and subscribe. See you next time.